So I hope that this works. Okay, I hope you can see it. Yep. Can yes, you see my we screen? can see yeah? perfectly well. Thank okay, you. great. Good. Now, thank you, uh, thank you much. Uh, uh, first of all, giving me the honor to um, speak in front of you. Oh, thank I you. I remember the, uh, my time in Salvador de Bahia. It's I think six years ago in the year of the um, World Championship, and um, <laughs> and so we had a, an, a wonderful time there and in a very interesting city. Um, and um, we had some interesting sightseeing and meeting friends. And I remember that I was also jogging with Osvaldo. So we had a <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite interesting. Yeah, <laughs> uh, in the lighthouse, in the Bahia yes. lighthouse. Yes, so yes. Was lighthouse. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, our topic today is is not uh, is perhaps also history, but a different history. It's in cochlear implants and other hearing solutions, and. Um, I just want to um, briefly um, divide all solutions in uh, to the mode of stimulation. So the, the acoustic um, stimulation is just given by the hearing aid to the outer ear canal. Um, the electric stimulation is by the cochlear implant uh, directly to the nerve. And then we have the mechanical or vibratory stimulation through implantable hearing aids. And uh, the vibratory energy is delivered to the uh, inner ear, either through the bone or through the um, middle ear. Now, that means that we probably, for all types and degrees of hearing loss, as you see it here in this chart from Cochlea, we probably have some solutions. Now, unfortunately, not all solutions that were on the market are still available. For instance, the, the DAX or the DASI here, Kodax device has been withdrawn. Uh, and also the Carina has been very strong, so that we probably have some gaps here, especially in the area between um, this degree of hearing loss, the, the mixed hearing loss, uh, with um, mild to moderate um, sensor and neural component and the cochlear implant. And that's, I think, the, the current situation, so that we still, uh, that we cannot um, really cover the whole field anymore due to this withdrawal of the products from the market. I mean, mainly for economic reasons. Um, now let's go for the um, first thing, a diagnostic procedure, where we have, I think, everything available from audiometry through imaging, through um, also the omics, and can also make a kind of prediction for the patient um, about his future course of hearing loss and what would be the best solution for him not only today, but also in um, the next years, the following years. And I think that's important that we always keep in mind uh, what will be uh, in five years' time uh, if you speak about the solution today. Now let's uh, first go to bone conduction devices. We actually um, have um, a lot of interest now, uh, especially due to some new developments. So the, the classic one is just the percutaneous with the screw. Um, as we can see here, still in use, very powerful, um, but uh, of course has some issues with infection and cosmesis. Um, there are some transcutaneous solutions such as the Baha Attract, which basically uh, is a magnet through the skin. And then we have uh, active uh, implants where the active component is implanted like, like in a cochlear implant. Of, of course, it's not an electrode, but a mechanical stimulator and we have an external speech processor, so like the bone bridge. Um, now, uh, all these devices bypass the middle ear and they stimulate the inner ear uh, through the uh, bone by vibrations. And, and of course, they have some limitations due to this fact. You see, I'm very uh, conservative saying bone conduction thresholds should at least um, be 30 dB or better. Then they definitely work. And there are several indications. We know malformations, chronic otitis, but also cases after tumor resection and so forth. Now, um, due to development in the processors, uh, which have become more powerful, um, you can, of course, extend your indication criterion and probably can go down to something like 40 to 50 dB bone conduction threshold uh, and still have enough or sufficient stimulation of the inner ear. That is true for the um, direct connect. 
Now, if you look for this Baha effect, of course, there is a dampening, and you have to reduce the uh, effectivity by about 5 to 15 decibels. And the same is true, of course, for single-sided deafness when you go for cross solution. Then you have to stimulate the other ear, which also reduces the effectivity. So this is only for the uh, hearing ear with uh, a direct connect. If you have the other solution, then, of course, your uh, threshold of uh, bone conduction will go up and you can serve patients, let's say, up to something like 30 dB. Here's some data from our patients. You see 58 patients, and that's basically the bone conduction threshold down here across frequencies, and that is monosyllable word scores. Now, if you would go for something like 60 dB, the patient should have, which is kind of, uh, you can use the device in everyday uh, situation. Then you see that uh, if you go up with your hearing loss, so bone conduction threshold becomes worse, then you see there's kind of cut off somewhere here. So that means between 40 and 50 dB, you see that the performance drops. And that is uh, where we set our criterion today. So we wouldn't go uh, for more than 40 dB bone conduction threshold just based on our data uh, we have. So that's just to summarize. So um, here we have the, the, the imitation that's 40 dB. Single-sided deafness, we would go only for 30 dB. Uh, that's basically our clinical schedule we, we use. Now, the active bars, there are two actually um, available. Um, the one is the, um, uh, the, the uh, bone bridge from Adele since uh, several years, and now also recently the OSIA from uh, Cochlea, and uh, other companies will come out soon uh, with the same type of solution. Um, so what they do is they have the active component implanted, which means they need, of course, an external processor for information transfer and for energy supply. And um, um, so the patient has to wear this button uh, on the head, and then the internal uh, um, system is driven and activated. Um, okay. Now, the main difference is that, of course, with the... Uh, these devices, transcutaneous ones, your rate of uh, revisions, uh, or complications, and explantations is much lower. So you see, our experience we had uh, with the percutaneous one is 21% some kind of revisions or explantations, whereas with the bone bridge, it's it's only less than 5%. So, and I think it clearly shows where where the future will be. Uh, I I think that these uh, percutaneous devices. Um, with a few exceptions, for instance, uh, patient needs repeated uh, MRI, um, then by time they will probably disappear from the market. Okay, now let's go for uh, the next group of implants. Uh, these are the uh, truly acoustic implants, um, and the only one um, left on the market is the Vibrant Soundbridge, which basically is um, um, inertial actuator. Uh, shown here, it's a kind of permanent magnet driven by uh, the coil, which uh, is um, stimulated by um, alternating current, and then you get forth and back movement, uh, as you can see here on this um, small uh, animation. Now, this device uh, is uh, in use uh, over 20 years, uh, initially only for sensory neural hearing loss, but today mainly for patients with some uh, type of conductive hearing loss, and you see kind of the indication scheme. Uh, you can serve patients uh, who have some degree of uh, sensory neural hearing loss, mainly in the high frequencies. Uh, the device, however, has some weakness in the low frequencies, and probably would say at 500 hertz, the hearing um, should be not worse than 45 uh, decibels or 50 decibels. Um, several options to couple it uh, to the auricular chain. For instance, you can combine it with TORP, with PORP, also with STAPIS. Uh, you can use different types on the round window, as you can see here, um, so that you stimulate also the ear uh, through the round window. And this uh, all is possible um, as long as you drive the, the inner ear in a sufficient way. And these patients, of course, have good improvement. 
preoperatively to postoperative, you see a huge improvement in word recognition um, or here SRT, um, also in noise. So they have significant improvement if you stay with the um, right indication criteria. Okay, now if, if these devices don't work, then the patient basically um, is a candidate for a cochlear implant. And our current criteria is that the patient should um, have less than 50 dB, uh, 50 percent, sorry, 50 percent monosyllable word scoring uh, with hearing aid. Um, and if he has equal or less, then uh, the cochlear implant will probably give him better hearing. Um, and that's then, um, of course, something we can offer to the patient. Now, cochlear implant um, replaces the function of the inner hair cells. It stimulates the auditory nerve directly, and um, we and can also uh, create some tonotopic simulation. So you see here one example, one contact is uh, activated and uh, a bundle of nerve fibers is uh, then activated consecutively. But this graph already shows the problem that we do not activate single nerve fibers, but always a bunch of. And this is the reason why these um, devices um, can, uh, so to say, give tonotopic information but only in frequency bands in, instead of tones. And therefore, for instance, tonal hearing like a music listening is uh, much worse than with uh, acoustic hearing. Um, okay, but they give enough information for speech understanding. Our surgical technique is uh, standardized. Um, we use it since many years, retroricular incision, exposure of the bone. We create the muscle, the bone bed, um, and then we expose um, the middle ear through the posterior tympanotomy, then uh, exposure of the round window membrane. And in most um, cases, we use approach through round window uh, only in a few cases where, for instance, we uh, have obliteration or there is a kind of um, a very um, narrow niche. Then we also go for some enlargement like here for, let's say, cochleostomy, and then we can insert the electrode very smoothly. We fix the electrode in, uh, especially lateral wall electrodes in this bone uh, niche. You see, you press it in so that the electrode uh, cannot uh, move. Uh, we always take uh, post-op CT scan in order to uh, confirm that the electrode position is right and also how deep the electrode is inserted. Special cases, uh, well, there are different techniques, for instance, for obliterated cochlea like split arrays, first and second turn can be drilled out and we can place them there. Um, the frequency of these cases has come down, I think due to the fact that we see those patients with post um, meningitic deafness very uh, soon after the event, so that we can, let's say, be faster than the obliteration is, um, but still, of course, we, we see it. Malformations is a, is a huge topic. Uh, I think uh, we see all kinds of, like common cavity, uh, like, like uh, cochlear aperture stenosis, uh, as you can see here, um, but also incomplete partitions. So and for each of these uh, malformations, we need a special solution, uh, which can be, so to say, offered. Now, there are some patients who have no um, uh, or, uh, internal auditory canal or there is no cochlea, then, of course, cochlear implant won't work. These are candidates for an auditory brainstem uh, implant. Here you see now uh, some features of surgery, common cavity. After opening, you see the gusher. Um, we have to deal with this. Normally, we can basically uh, just close the cochlea and uh, can handle this gusher. Uh, we rarely need any kind of lumbar drainage. Um, but of course, these um, uh, inner ear situations are less favorable for stimulation. We don't know where the nerve fibers are. And therefore, uh, the re result might be very um, um, variant. Complications, yes, we have it. Um, medical complications in about uh, three to four percent. Most of them can be managed conservatively, but a, pa a patient like this here, where we have a, a, a skin breakdown, uh, we need surgical intervention. Um, then we have complications from technology, so implant device failure in our series. Uh, overall is about two to three uh, percent. Some uh, devices we know had some issues where the failure rate was much higher, but uh, due to corrective actions, 
um, I think overall the um, reliability of the implants has uh, been improved over the decades and is uh, favorable low uh, compared to other um, medical implants. Here you see an issue of uh, another complication, which is electrode migration. You see here initial position of the electrode, and then over time, the electrode was basically migrating out of the cochlea. And so you have to go in and reinsert uh, it, which just shows the importance of a, a good fixation of the electrode um, in patients. Now, cochlear implant is a success story, yes. Um, you see that from the first implants in, in the uh, late 70s um, up to the day, there is a huge improvement. And from contact to word of sound, patients today can discriminate speech. Some also enjoy music. There is, uh, uh, of course, a huge need. You see candidates in Germany, only 1 million, and implanted about 55,000. So a lot to do. Then we have speech test results. I think also in interesting to see that with old implants, patients had a slow progress, and especially speech and noise, they did quite poor. Compared to modern implants, where they have a steep progress, and have much higher scores at the uh, sentence test in noise now. Uh, so it shows the impact of technology and, and uh, technology progress, which really has um, brought us up in our results and also in the indications. Now, if you summarize our results, you see from about 10,000 patients, today we can say that 80% of the adult population have open set speech understanding, can use the telephone. In children, it's clear that uh, they can achieve near to normal auditory and speech development, but this is mainly related to duration and age of deafness and time of implantation. The earlier, the better. And also bilateral implantation gives additional benefit uh, for our patients. But still, we see a huge um, variation in results and performance here just from children. You see the range uh, of uh, comprehension score. Uh, some have zero, others have uh, basically normal hearing, and uh, still this is a huge uh, area for research. We don't understand it really in all our patients, why they do uh, well and why they um, are poor performance. Um, okay, now um, with the improvement in technology, we also are able to serve patients who have residual hearing. And it means that we see more, more and more patients they, which have uh, the high frequency deafness like here or still residual hearing across frequencies. And the question is, of course, uh, what would be the best treatment? Is it always only electric stimulation? Uh, so uh, using a long electrode or is it sometimes possible to preserve residual hearing and uh, still use the existing acoustic hearing together with electrical stimulation, so-called AIS? Um, and uh, that is something uh, which has uh, been the main topic of our work in the last years. Now, we have to keep into consideration that the cochlea itself is uh, very variable in length and in height, and which means that if we want to, let's say, cover the cochlea for stimulation, um, either completely or partially, we have to look on the length of the cochlea. And this can be measured today just from the CT scan, and then we can make a kind of selection of the electrode or um, insertion depths. You see here kind of possibility to make a model of the cochlea, and then you can make a virtual surgery. You can place your electrode sort of virtually into it, and then you see how deep you would uh, come with. Uh, the cochlear coverage, that means the part of the cochlea that is covered or uh, re reached by the electrode is important in terms of what we achieve in for with speech understanding in electric stimulation only. So you see, um, if the coverage is um, complete, it would be a one. If it's zero, it's zero. And uh, here you see all uh, the, the, uh, the variations in the middle. Now, when we look on patients with uh, different cochlear coverage, we see that the best results are achieved with a coverage of about 0.75. That means three quarters of the whole cochlea are somewhat reached by the electrode. And this is uh, true for different testing we have done. So what we would do for our patient uh, that we go measure the cochlea length, and then we choose, you see, from our portfolio of electrodes, the appropriate one, uh, which gives us this 
kind of, of coverage. And here that's our recommendation just for the metal devices. Um, so if you have a small cochlea, then we use 24 millimeters, medium sized 28, long cochlea, um, then the flex soft, which is 31 millimeters. So that's basically uh, a rule of the thumb uh, we can derive from it. Now let's go for patients who have uh, a lot of residual hearing and uh, who still can use it by uh, their uh, hearing aid. And you see in those patients, high frequencies can be replaced or restored with the electric stimulation while low frequency are still given by the um, hearing aid and we call it electroacoustic stimulation or hybrid device. Now, um, of course, um, we want to preserve the residual hearing, but um, the rate of preservation is uh, dependent on the length of the electrode. So let's say for a short electrode, which is only 15 millimeters, the, uh, the uh, risk for become deaf is 7%. But if you go for a long electrode, like 28 millimeters, the risk to become deaf is 35%. So of course, if you want to preserve your signal hearing, you probably would go and use only a shorter electrode. Now the downside of using a short electrode is shown here. Um, if you have good uh, preservation of residual hearing and the patient can use AIS, then your scores, for instance, here speech and noise are very good, yeah? something 80% or so. But if this patient loses the hearing for some reason du during surgery or after surgery, then he probably with a short electrode drops down to something uh, which is very low, like 20 or 25%. So that means if we choose a short electrode for the reason of hearing preservation, uh, it might be a bad choice if the patient has lost his hearing and is uh, um, dependent on electric stimulation only. Because longer electrodes, yeah, um, for instance here, uh, shown a longer electrode for electric stimulation only, um, gives him um, better scores. So we have a trade-off um, and the question is how to overcome. Well, we developed this concept of partial insertion, which means that we use a longer electrode, but insert it only partially. Huh? So for instance, here it's shown you have a long electrode, but you insert it only uh, to a certain extent to cover the high frequency area of the patient, the cochlea. Um, and with this, we try to minimize the risk of becoming deaf. But in case the patient would lose hearing, we could just go in again and the second step move the electrodes deeper in, so they afterload uh, the electrode then um, deeper. Um, and we have developed a kind of uh, selection tool uh, where we can, um, based on the length of the cochlea and the residual hearing of the patient, we can, so to say, calculate how deep we uh, would like to insert a given electrode. Uh, and then we do it, insert it, and um, as you can see here, so the insertion depth is marked here on the electrode, then it's inserted and it's fixed. And you see here the CT scan post-operatively that some electrodes are staying out, uh, some contacts. Uh, that is basically then due to this partial insertion. Um, of course, we can also use monitoring, uh, ECOG monitoring during uh, the surgery, which helps us to look on the uh, residual hearing while we insert, and then we can follow the signal and if the signal, you see, as it's shown here, goes up, grows, then it's fine once while we insert and it should stay like this. Uh, if we have a drop, then we can sort of say correct our in, uh, insertion. We can stop or we can pull it back and so that we have an additional tool to uh, increase our rate of hearing preservation. I'll just skip it. So, okay. Now we see here on the result again, one patient it's, uh, has been implanted, that is his pre, that is his post-operative threshold, uh, well preserved, and this patient then can use electroacoustic stimulation. Here you see a larger series of patients uh, where we did it. Um, you see, for instance, here Flex 24 was only partially implanted, 18 millimeters, or Flex 28, only 20 millimeters on average. And you see the hearing preservation rate, very good preservation in uh, 70 or 60%. This is a rate of deafness in only one patient lost this hearing. So I think it's kind of a concept that probably works. And you see here the results of AIS doing very well, HSM sentence test in noise. You see uh, patients um, go up after three months, six months, 
and you see they have very high scores um, with this kind of combined hearing. And I think uh, it shows that we should aim at uh, really achieving it. Okay, so summarizing, um, patients who have little residual hearing below frequencies, we would go for electric stimulation only, use the appropriate length of uh, electrode. Patients with good res residual hearing low frequencies, we would go for um, uh, AIS and um, try to preserve residual hearing and using this concept of individualized cochlear implantation. Now, future, of course, we want to, to become better. We want to serve patients with presbycusis, but this means that our preservation rate has to go up something like 90%, like in staple surgery. And of course, there are several tools we can use. Uh, today, uh, we concentrate on better surgery, for instance, using robotic systems, but also drugs that are administered uh, together with the implant to reduce the trauma reaction. Just show you some, some things here, uh, drug uh, delivery to the cochlea. Uh, we can use a catheter to insert uh, to inject, sorry, uh, steroids um, right at the time of surgery, and then um, we uh, uh, insert the electrode. The recent development, the most recent development, is now um, a drug eluting electrode. Um, we started a clinical study recently where we have an electrode that uh, basically is coated with dexamethasone, and the electrode um, he releases this, uh, this uh, um, dexamethasone after um, implantation. And the first results we have got are looking quite promising in terms of reduction of impedances, but also hearing preservation. But there is there are very preliminary data. The second one is that we use robotic surgery, that we go for kind of uh, using a robot uh, to help us to insert the electrode in the most atraumatic uh, and best direction um, uh, and you see here such a system where a, a trajectory is planned and then this trajectory is basically followed by uh, by help of a kind of uh, of tool that exactly gives the trajectory for drilling uh, down to the cochlea and also for electrode insertion and uh, you see here how it's made it's basically a, a drill path uh, the, ch the chick is made intraoperatively um, depending on the patient's anatomy uh, by the planning and this chick then is you see brought then on the patient's uh, head here and then you see the drill in the patient's head uh, really uh, goes then directly uh, down to the cochlea exactly in the trajectory that has been pre-calculated. Um, you also can insert the electrode uh, not by hand, but with the help of a robot. You see here one recent development, the so-called Robotol, which is um, a roboter that uh, helps you to insert the electrode with low, very low speed, um, something which might be also important. And you see here um, an insertion tool we created. It's a pneumatic system. You can insert the electrode very slowly precisely in the drill path, as I have shown you. So this all will probably uh, come into uh, routine practice once the systems have been really integrated and become more handy and, and easy to use. Well, our vision is, of course, we want to give the best um, possible treatment for each patient, and we want to make it very individual so that we also can tell the patient what is the best treatment option for him and then also do it in the most precise way as we can do. And with this, uh, to serve our patients uh, using all the possibilities we have available today. Even it sounds uh, sometimes a bit, uh, let's say, very advanced or um, uh, not yet in practice. But we know from history that many things uh, that initially were uh, kind of exploratory or experimental later became then routine. And I'm sure that uh, many of these developments will go the same path uh, into our practice. Thank you much for your attention. Oh, thank you, Professor. I would like now, Professor Lyers, you to make some comments or some questions about the, the wonderful presentation. Yes, thank you, Jose. Thank you very much, Thomas, for your always very interesting presentations and full of new information and uh, the huge experience that uh, you have in over always give us some new thoughts. I also just to comment a few things and uh, to ask you some 
some doubts that I have. First, I, I like it very much your comments about the um, osseous, the, the bony anchorage hearing aids or not. We have not to say Baja today because it's a trademark, but the uh, bony anchorage prosthesis. Uh, the, the, the threshold of the bone conduction is very, very, very important. And I like very much that you put that uh, in the active ear, your limit for uh, implantations is 40, 40 dB. I think that this is a very important issue. And uh, although the manufacturers say that we can put implants for uh, hearing, la hearing uh, losses of higher than 50, 55 percent. Mm -hmm. I think that we should be care about this. And uh, I agree totally that the limit of 40 dB would be more safe for the patients. And regarding the unilateral hearing loss, uh, for the contralateral, we have to have a normal uh, osseous threshold, 20 dB. It will be the better, the better situation for a, a good uh, diagnosis. So thank you very much to to confirm these uh, thoughts. After that, uh, I would like to ask you about your experience with the vibrant sound bridge in the round window. That you have uh, many cases when you put the the vibration uh, devices in the round window, mm -hmm. and if how are your results about this? Yeah, I think the uh, the results are um, um, in principle are good, but we have we see a lot of variability you know, in the results, and uh, uh, I think one reason is um, that the precision of coupling um, is still an issue. So you, we we know about this um, uh, differences in anatomy. So for instance, um, the um, width of the uh, round window. Uh, is very different. Also, the angle at which you can uh, place yeah. your coupler um, is very different. And then, of course, we also have um, issue of how much space do we have uh, to the hypotympanum. If you have patients with high jugular bulb, it can be difficult to create enough space to, to bring it in. So there are many issues which um, explain part of the variability. And then, of course, we also uh, cannot uh, control very well the um, the preload, that means um, how much force is really uh, on the coupler itself uh, at, the at the membrane. So this is something which makes it different to other coupling sites like the staples head um, and even the foot plate might, uh, might, be, uh, might be something um, different. So I think the, um, uh, this explains uh, part of the issue. So we try to improve the situation by creating uh, a different coupler, which allows us uh, to control some of these parameters. But we also have this fibrosis um, that is uh, occurring after surgery, which of course is very difficult to control. And I think the, uh, the fibrosis might also uh, uh, detach the, um, uh, the coupling site from the round window membrane. Huh? So you see to get some uh, just um, forces that tear it away. So all this, I think, contributes to it. And uh, but we know some years we don't have another possibility to couple uh, at the in the ear. Um, and especially in uh, chronic ears, we would not like to open, let's say, the foot plate to bring in uh, a stapes piston or something like that, which by from a mechanical point might be better. But uh, from the biological risk, it might be not the best solution. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Very yeah. Professor uh, Lenners. Yeah. Just yeah, we continue. Question. Yeah. Question. Uh, you said that you have a CT scan in every patient in post-op just to see the position of uh, the electrode. Uh, do you think uh, even if we have a nice uh, Neurometry, you have to have the CT because we we don't do that uh, on a regular basis. Yeah. What are your suggestions? Yeah, but well, the point is just to uh, to um, also measure how deep we are in the cochlea, 
um, uh, uh, and um, this has some issues for the programming. So um, that we um, take this information uh, not only for checking the the, the appropriate position, but um, also uh, to help see uh, how deep we are and where the contacts are. No, that's uh, I think it's still a matter of uh, some research, but we see some um, correlation between performance and this the depth of insertion. No? Great. You also said that uh, the early implantation in children, the better the results. What is your age limit for implantation? Do you think the six months is okay or you prefer? Yeah. I think you could, yeah. of course, we can identify the children very early um, uh, due to universal neonatal healing screening. Um, but the point is, of course, that um, uh, uh, you uh, have a very small child and uh, the risk uh, of elective surgery is probably higher if the child is uh, below six months of age. So we uh, normally would then say we wait until they, their body is mature enough so that mm -hmm. the, the risk of any surgery is, um, so to say, much less. I think that is one reason. And also I think the, the parents often they need some time to uh, figure out what to do but that is very individually different. Um, if you have uh, post meningitic deafness, for instance, then we also go for earlier age, like four months. I think the youngest we have implanted is something like three months. Uh, uh, that was just after uh, meningitis. And uh, to, um, let's say, implant before obliteration occurs, uh, which is then a, um, a difficult situation. Okay. And uh... The last question, Jose. Uh, you also mm -hmm. mentioned that for hearing preservation, you can use a long electrode, but do a partial insertion, and uh, in and later, if the uh, the hearing decrease, you can reintroduce it or uh, put in the electrode in the or covering a, a more space in the cochlea. Mm -hmm. But don't you think the fibrosis or any change in the inner ear can mm -hmm. prevent this insertion or the... Um, yeah, we have, what we what have, you have, uh, what mm -hmm. experience? Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. We have some uh, experience and in cases they uh, who lost their hearing. And actually the fibrosis is mainly outside the cochlea. So you have it, as we know, in the, in the um, uh, mastoid and also in the probably close to the cochleostomy. But inside the cochlea, the fibrosis is very little. It's only in cases where we have labyrinthitis that you uh, get more fibrosis. Um, but normally it's, a, it's only very thin uh, um, connective tissue sheath that is around the electrode. And you can easily insert the electrode deeper um, without resistance and, uh, and then on uh, fix the electrode appropriately so that it stays in the cochlea. And uh, we found this um, feasible in all the cases we have done, I think three or so we have now, um, where this was necessary. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Osvaldo, for your Thank, you. Thank you. It's early Great. morning for you, no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, that's now, much, now it's yeah. OK, 7, 7.30. <laughs> yeah. Professor, I would like to ask you, about some two or three questions. First, uh, about the conventional hearing aids in children. How early do you indicate the, conver the conventional hearing aids? Because recently there has been a proposal by a, a new joint uh, that you should be even earlier for the diagnosis and, and hearing stimulation by, by conventional hearing aid, uh, aids in children, in small yeah. children. Yeah. So how early do you go for this fitting? Just in addition, yeah, to the yeah, just in hmm, just in addition to what I said to the question of, uh, from Professor Oswaldo, um, we uh, recommend and we also do um, the hearing aid fitting in these very small children before implantation, yeah? so that we at least try to also use some residual hearing or even vibratory information um, uh, in the children, so that they get attention to. Uh, sound that surrounds them. Um, so as early as possible, even if it's difficult with a small ear and everything, but uh, we have 
uh, experts, um, um, pediatric uh, hearing aid acousticians who um, can do it very well. Um, Sure. So even early as three, two or three months, you would uh, go for the hearing aid feature. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. try as early as possible. Um, yeah. Professor, about uh, chronic otitis media, what would be your strategy strategy for the surgery in this case? Do you would you do two surgeries or do you would you do one surgery? What what is your strategy for this this patients? It depends on what you want to place. I mean, uh, a bone conduction device you can place without any other measures for the um, for the Vibrant Sound Bridge and also for the cochlear implant. Um, you probably need a safe ear. Huh? And uh, the point is uh, that, of course, uh, you should not have any infection, uh, any uh, risk of um, uh, exposure of electrode or um, uh, the actuator um by uh, through a skin breakdown and that is the reason why um, we uh, do first the ear surgery in order to um, get rid of the infection and the inflammation depends on what we find let's say we have uh, just the eardrum perforation would we'll close it um, if we have um, some cholesteatoma remove it first and then wait and the second stage then uh, do the implantation. Now in cases of um, uh, uh, radical cavity or canal go down or where we have um, uh, cases where we cannot uh, really um, do a closed technique, then we would go and do a subtotal petrosectomy with blind sac closure um, so that we obliterate it with abdominal fat. <laughs> And then we go uh, in after six months and do the implantation. That is, I think, in our experience, the safest way. Um, and uh, we avoid this kind of uh, complicated cases where you do uh, only a one stage procedure, you do the um, eradication of the inflammation and at the same time the implant. In our experience, this has not really worked out very well. So we had uh, too many cases where we had to then an infection breakdown of the uh, skin uh, and so on. And so we uh, basically have given that up. Um, Great. One last question, Professor, about many air disease. Uh, in some patients, you may get improvement in the tinnitus and even in the hearing, but sometimes the patient still has uh, a dizziness or a schwindel. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, what would you consider? Of course, this, this is a rare situation. Uh, and uh, how would you manage? Of course, we try medical therapy, but would you consider uh, uh, endal infected sac decompression or even no. intratympanic treatment in, 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 in a patient that is already implanted? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, what you could do is to, to give him um, either the gentamicin, yeah? that could be uh, one option. Uh, but what we do at the time of uh, the cochlear implantation, for instance, we uh, make a sac decompression huh? because it's just in your in your way. So with the implantation, you can also do the sac exposure. Um, and uh, so then you have this kind of treatment. If it's still persistent, uh, then it can have different reasons. So one is the many years, the other could be due to the implantation. Huh? Uh, it's hard to see. And uh, to do some nerve section, I think we have done only I don't know, three, four cases after implantation, very rare that there was a need for that. Um, but of course, you still also could do that, that you go in again and make your um, um, make your uh, nerve section, uh, retrosigmoid or, uh, yeah, well, or even trans flap approach. No? Mm. Oh, that's great. Okay. Okay. Do you have any other question, Professor Lyons? No, that's okay. I am satisfied. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> We'd like to thank you again, all of you, and in name of Professor Nuvan Mandaraji, who is the chief in our department. We'd like to thank again and say it was a wonderful uh, morning and thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation and hope to to see you in person very soon again. So, and hope we all do well, stay healthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
and uh, we can basically behave as normal. <laughs> yeah. Is there a second wave? Is there a second wave in Europe? Do you, do you believe that uh, it will be too bad as the first, uh, the so COVID wave? Actually, we have the second wave now um, in, in Europe and also in Germany, and the numbers are much higher than in the first wave. Oh, um, that's terrible. Um, so, but the severity, or let's say the number of severe cases, probably is not that high. Um, it's different in other countries like Italy and so on. And I think it's um, there are many, uh, post, um, let's say, answers why that is the case. Uh, well, first of all, I think the uh, the social behavior is very different uh, across Europe. No? So the northern countries uh, uh, they have more social distancing in any way. No? So we we have many more people who live alone, or you don't uh, embrace the others, you, you don't kiss them, and what else. So that's very unusual in Germany. So yeah. and uh, and the second is um, that um, of course our, um, our healthcare system. No? Is, uh, uh, is much more resilient uh, than in other countries because we still have a lot of uh, hospital beds, a lot of hospitals, and also a lot of, um, uh, let's say, emergency um, beds. Um, so just for, for Germany, we have, um, uh, we have actively, or we have active uh, 45,000 emergency beds. No? Which is um, five times higher uh, compared to the population now uh, upon the population base than, for instance, in the UK, or uh, three times higher than in France, or so. Huh? So actually, we don't run that fast into some limits, uh, and then uh, to make it triage and whatever. So this, I think, also helps to bring it down. The, the main point is, of course, that um, you need enough staff, no? enough personnel that can treat the patients. And that means that, of course, uh, routine cases or other cases um, cannot be treated. Yeah? So, for instance, cancer patients, uh, uh, we, uh, we can't do uh, the necessary treatment because all the resources go, um, or not all, but more resources go to treat COVID-19 patients. And I think that is an issue we have um, uh, in, the, uh, in the discussion. Huh? Um, so how can you really keep the balance? Yeah? That's basically, I don't know how in Brazil, I think you also uh, had a, a very high number of infections and and also um, the mortality rate was quite high, what, what we heard. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's terrible. We are, maybe we'll get a second wave also, yeah. Here in Sao Paulo, mm, the yeah. second wave is starting, but uh, exactly as uh, Thomas said, the mortality rate is very lower now. And uh, I think they learn how to treat more severe cases. So, but uh, the private hospitals, especially, uh, are, are full of patients because with the lib social liberation parties and uh, restaurants and younger uh, meetings are, are increasing the number. But hopefully, the aggressivity would be less than the first wave. But Isn't Thomas. Mm -hmm. Stay safe and very and have a very wonderful weekend. Yeah. You, Take some rest and stay uh, safe. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy the beach. Yeah, <laughs> it was a pleasure. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> thank bye you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. -bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.